As you're turning to Acts uh, chapter 20, as we're just continuing our study through the book of Acts, uh, without raising hands, uh, this is without a response, I'm not looking for you to raise hands, but I want you to consider this question with me. How many of you, as you sit here today, see yourself as leaders? Now, uh, some of you, yes, I'm a leader. Others, I'm not sure. And still others of us might say, no, I'm not a leader. Now, I want to encourage you to consider this with me. Leadership is first and foremost influence. And each and every one of you has influence. You have influence among your family. You have influence among your friends. Influence at your place of work. Influence in your school. All of you are leaders. Some are called to lead a couple. Some are leading many. And I want you to consider this with me. Would you like to lead people to grow in Christ in this year? No. I assume that if we did ask for a show of hands, that almost every hand would be raised. Yes, I want to help people to grow in Christ and have that type of influence in this coming year. Presumably the only ones who wouldn't raise their hand are those who didn't hear the question. Oh, come back. Don't check out this early in the message. Come back. So presuming that all of us want to be those kind of leaders, I want you to consider this with me. If you were to lead passionately for Christ in this coming year, if you were to exercise influence so that those who are near and dear to you were growing in Christ because of your passionate leadership, what difference would that make in your life? What difference would that make in your family? If you're married with your spouse, if you have children with your children, whether they're young or not so young, with your parents? What influence, what effect would it have in your workplace, in your school, your community, however you define that, your church? To lead with passion, Paul, as he wrote to the church at Rome, said those who have been gifted with an ability to lead should do so with diligence, with zeal, with passion, with a fire. And I want to encourage you to think big what it would look like for a, a church with a thousand adults on a weekend to be on fire for Christ and how that would influence the homes in this community, how it would influence families, neighborhoods, how the gospel would be advanced in a community, how the gospel would be advanced in the world. What is God looking for? People have a passionate love for him, a passionate love that translates to influence, that causes fires among other people of passionate love. And now I do want to ask you to respond. How many of you want to be those kind of leaders? Raise your hand. Okay, hands down. Some of you, that was great. Some of you, well, I'm not sure, you know. Do one of these things, like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know, here. <laughs> All right, let's see what that looks like together. Would you stand with me? We're in Acts chapter 20. I'm going to begin reading at verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia and what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but I proclaimed it to you. And I taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you 
for this church. And I thank you, Lord, that it's a church that loves you, that loves one another, that delights, Lord, to be passionate. And yet, Father, I pray that you would stir us, that more of us would desire to be passionate for you, and that we, all of us, would be more passionate for you. And so, Lord, no argument of the intellect, no desire to discipline our flesh can accomplish that. Only your Holy Spirit, Lord, can do that work. So would you please pour out your Spirit in this place and transform us, Lord, that we can be the leaders you've called us to be. We thank you, we praise you, we ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So what are we going to talk about together here in Acts chapter 20? Here we're looking at Paul exhorting the elders from Ephesus, Paul exhorting the Ephesian elders. And really the objective that God has in store for us, I believe, is that we would all lead with passion, that we would all lead with passion. In the context, Paul is, is now traveling towards Jerusalem. He's hurrying to get there before the Feast of Pentecost. He wants to gather the leaders from the church at Ephesus where he'd been serving for the last three years and have them meet him so that he can train them and prepare them one final time before he heads to Jerusalem. He doesn't expect to ever see them again. He's imparting to them. So to speak, this is the very first pastor's conference that we see in the scriptures. But I would submit to you that this lesson, I would submit to you that this message, I would submit to you that these truths are not simply intended for those who hold the office of elder or those who are considered pastors, but it is a message to everyone who considers themselves a Christian, a follower of Christ. And so, what we're going to consider together are six key principles to be passionate leaders for Christ. Six key principles to be passionate leaders for Christ. First principle, be available. Be available. It says at verse 17 that, that Paul called for the elders from the church at Ephesus to meet him at Miletus. Ephesus is approximately 30 miles away. These guys are coming on foot. It's a sacrifice. It's a hardship. They're coming to meet with Paul. They're coming to be encouraged by Paul to receive from Paul. They're going to have a, a schlep. This is what my people talk about, a long walk, a schlep. And so they're going to schlep to Ephes from Ephesus to Miletus, and, and they're going to meet with Paul, and they're going to have to schlep back. They're not going to be able to get in a helicopter, a train, a plane, or a car. It's all on foot. And the first thing I want you to see is they were available, and Paul was available to meet. And I don't want to be trite or cliche, but it's important that we understand this, okay? No matter how able you are, if you refuse to be available, it's for naught. The first step is you need to be available to serve God. And so at verse 18, Paul says, you know what manner I lived and you know what manner I served with all humility. And I think it's important for us not only to consider this availability issue, but to consider the reputation. Paul says, you know. And, and similarly, you know people that serve. For example, the people that were on the platform acknowledged as leaders, you've seen them serving as you have spent any time as part of the community at Calvary Nexus. I rejoice over the countless servants that are here. I mean, one of the things that's amazing about our, our church is because we're one church meeting at two campuses, that means there's twice as many children's ministry volunteers, twice as many ushers, twice as many greeters, twice as many prayer intercessors, twice as many refreshment people, twice as many people to eat the refreshments. Oh, all of this that goes on, the facilities maintenance, the facilities cleanup, all of this is doubled. And, and so I rejoice. There's many, many servants here. Now, proportionally, it's unlike any church I've experienced. Yet, yet, despite the fact that there are many hundreds of volunteers, there's some of you that aren't involved in any form of serving the community. You don't consciously think about serving your family. You don't consciously think about serving your church community. You don't consciously think about serving in your neighborhood or community at large. 
I want you to consider this with me. Paul says, you know my manner of service with all humility. The idea of humility is not simply thinking less of yourself. See this, it's thinking of yourself less. And all of the, the scriptures, all the red letters that you have in the New Testament, the words of Christ, there's only one autobiographical statement that Jesus ever made. We find it in Matthew chapter 11 at verse 29. I am gentle and humble. This is the nature of Christ. Humility, putting the needs of others before his own. This is the great truth that Paul reveals in Philippians chapter 2. To have that mind which is Christ who humbled himself, denied himself of his, his privileges, his rights so that he could serve. This is why Jesus says in Mark chapter 10, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to be a servant. And to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve. The king of kings who should be served, he comes to serve us. And I, I just consider this with you. Do you have a heart to serve others? Do you have a heart to do that without recognition, without applause, without affirmation? If every time you serve, you do it so that others acknowledge you, others thank you, others express appreciation, you're frustrated or upset if you don't get that, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. I am. I, I am blessed to serve here. I, I thank God for the privilege of serving here. And, and so many of you understand that in October, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. And, and so uh, October's come, October's come. Let me just say, I'm not saying this to make anybody feel bad or guilt or anything, but check this out. In a church where about 3,000 people gather to celebrate Resurrection Sunday, in October, I get a handful of cards that thank you, Pastor Card. And I'm not saying this because I'm fishing for more cards next October. My point is to say is, if that would throw me off my groove. In other words, well, these people don't appreciate all that I've done for them. Why don't they say thank you? Why don't they affirm? I would have thrown in the towel. And same for you. Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you available? How do you plan to be available? Are you going to go through another year of not being available? Not leading? Not leading with passion? How has God called you to be available to your family, to your church, to your community? Whatever that is, your school, your neighborhood, a community group, your workplace. How's God called you to serve? And are you available to serve him? Second key idea here. First, be available. Second, be Christ-centered. Be Christ-centered. Paul says at verse 21, the, the essence of his ministry was to communicate a message of repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is the idea of changing our thinking about God, changing our thinking about sin, and to align ourselves with God's word, God's view of himself, his word, our sin. And then faith towards Christ. Now, this was the, the essence of, of Paul's ministry. He wanted to be Christ-centered. It wasn't a, hey, check me out. It was, hey, check out Jesus. I think about this, and how am I representing Jesus to my wife? How am I representing Jesus to my sons? How do I represent Jesus to you, those that I am privileged to serve? One day after a, a Sunday service, a lady catches me in the foyer. She's an older gal, and, and she's wagging her finger in my face. So I slapped her. Huh? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure you were still with me here in the conversation. So she said, this is what she said. This was the indictment. This is what she was so upset about. She goes, do you have to talk about Jesus every Sunday? One of the nicest compliments I've ever received. And, and so it, it's not that, you know, from the morning when I wake up to the evening when I put my head on the pillow, that all day long I just go around going, Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's not like that. But I'm conscious that how am I representing Jesus in this moment, 
in this place, in this setting. Paul, Paul said, uh, beginning of verse 22, I, I, I don't know exactly what's in store for me. I'm going bound in the Spirit. I know that God's called me to go to Jerusalem. And everywhere, every city I go to, they testify that when I get to Jerusalem that I'm going to be bound. I'm going to experience tribulation. I'm going to experience hardship. He, he knows that when he goes to Jerusalem that he's going to suffer for the Lord. And he, he says to them, look, um, while I was with you testifying, Jesus, I held nothing back from you. Verse 18, I held nothing back. The Greek term is, is a medical term that would speak of withholding medicine or food from a patient. And I look at it and I say, well, what am I holding back? Do I hold back affection? Do I hold back affirmation? Do I hold back encouragement? Do I hold myself back that I won't be vulnerable? Do I spend time with my, my family praying? Not as much as I could, not as much as I should. Do I spend time with my family in the Word of God? Um, my, my sons are early risers. My wife isn't. It's about 9.30. She may be waking from the slumber right now. Praise God. <laughs> Maybe not. That's why we have an evening service, just in case. <laughs> but every morning, my, my sons wake up. They, they see me reading my Bible, having my coffee, see me praying. But in the midst of their need to get ready and to go out the door for school or work or, or whatever it might be, I don't have that time of family devotion as my sons have gotten older. And I'm wrestling now. How do I, how do I figure out? I, I don't want to hold that back. And even though there's obstacles to coordinating it, I've got to figure it out because I've been called to lead. And Paul said, look, I, I am going to finish my race with joy and testify of the gospel of Christ. Now, I, I want to encourage you to consider this with me. What's your race? We, we all have a common race in the sense that, that we're all on this same path of the Christian faith. But each of us has a unique race that we're running. When I was in high school, I ran cross country. And, and so everybody's on that same course, but everybody approaches it uniquely. Some people are front runners. They're just like the rabbit. They go at the start and they're going full speed. And, and a few of them can keep that pace up. Most can't. And so if you try to be a front runner and you really don't have the stamina, the endurance, you don't finish the race. Others are plotters. They're not trying to win, win the race. They're, they're trying to finish the race and to enhance their time. And they plod and incrementally improve their time, but they finish their race. Others are people who make the ascent up hills and they do great. Other people can make that descent and they can fly. Some people have a great kick towards the finish line and they can catch people ahead of them. And until you figure out what God's called you to do. How can you say that you're finishing your race? It is more than just identifying yourself as a Christian. He has uniquely called you and gifted you to advance his kingdom. And Paul says, look, verse 24, I know I'm going to suffer, but none of these things move me. I'm going to do what God called me to do to proclaim Christ. Nothing None of it's going to move me. The sacrifice, the hardship. And I want you to think right now. What's going to move you from doing what God's called you to do? Are you going to be moved because of a promotion? Are you going to be moved because of your recreation? Are you going to be moved because of your love for your friends or your family that, that you don't discover what God's called you to do and do that as well? And then my encouragement to you is to resolve to be Christ-centered. And let me finally say, some of you are never moved. <laughs> There's many of you who are in the midst of your race and you're in the midst of your calling. And, and, and so my exhortation to you is don't be moved from that. As you get older and as the years go on, there's a tendency to ease on the accelerator. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Don't take your foot off the accelerator and throw the car into park. God never called you to that. But there's others of you that you've never gotten the car out of park. You're not even in neutral, let alone in gear. Nothing moves you. The word of God doesn't move you. The spirit of God doesn't move you. The exhortation, the understanding of the nature of the kingdom of God, the nature of the church to advance God's kingdom, nothing moves you. I don't want to try to manipulate you or cause you to feel guilty or cause you to feel shame. I want you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. There's not a single person here that hasn't been called to lead. Stop justifying. Stop rationalizing. Stop seeking your own comfort and seek Christ and lead. Amen? Third, to be Bible-centered. To be Bible-centered. Uh, take a look with me, beginning at verse 25. And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Drop down with me, if you would, to verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So, Paul says, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not guilty. I, I'm free. I'm innocent of bloodshed. And here's his reason why. Because I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Paul spent three years pouring into the church at Ephesus, pouring into the leaders of the church at Ephesus so that they would understand the whole counsel of God. And I would suggest to us that the only way that you can understand the whole counsel of God is to be exposed to, to read, and to understand the Bible. Right? Amen? And so this is why we teach the Bible here. I don't say we teach from the Bible we teach the Bible. All the teaching pastors here do, and that's what we model in our youth ministry, young adult ministry, children's ministry, community groups. We want to expose you to the Word of God. That's why we teach verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter, book by book, so that you understand the Word of God in context and can respond to Him. Jesus quotes in Matthew 4, 4 from Deuteronomy 8, 3. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. Now, I just want to encourage you. There's some of you that don't like to eat. You don't partake of the word of God. You, you're, you'd be in the spiritual realm emaciated, malnourished, anemic, and with the risk of dying because you're not taking in any nourishment. Now, I'll tell you, I like to eat in the physical realm. You, you might think, well, it doesn't look like it's all about loose clothing, people, okay? So, and so yesterday, I was officiating at a vow renewal of a 25th anniversary of a couple that, that it, it was a, a Wonderful gathering, but one of the best parts, and I was saying beforehand, this is a Filipino wedding vow renewal. And a Filipino wedding vow renewal is the best food ever. <laughs> I, I mean, and the people, you know, it's just piling up the food. You know, it looks like the, the Sierra Nevada mountain range on, on people's plates all around the reception area. Tons of food, and, and nobody says, well, you know, I'm just too busy to eat. Nobody says that. Well, you know, I'd like to eat, but I, I've got to go to work. I, I'd like to eat, but I've got to go to school. People find time to do eat in the physical realm. Why don't you find time to eat in the spiritual realm? Why aren't you hungry for the Word of God? Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy, he said, look, all Scripture is inspired by God. It's God-breathed. It's alive. It's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for, so that the man or woman of God might be complete, spiritually mature, lacking nothing. You cannot be built up, and it says at verse 32, absent the word of God in your life. We need the word of God. 
I want to encourage you. There's a Bible reading plan on the church website, a couple different ones. Start being people of the book. And, and read, not just, well, i got to get this checked off like a ritual, get my reading done, check the box. Read to hear from God. God's love letter to you. God's instruction in righteousness, God's requirement, what God requires, what he desires. You know, the... That so many of us, we are conditioned these days that, man, we wake up and we check our phone, want to check the emails, want to check uh, the sports, social media, we're tweeting, we're, we're updating, we're instant messaging, we're doing all of that. And then we say, I don't have time for God. It's ridiculous. It's got to stop. Why? Because the word of God is the lamp unto your feet, a light to your path, the psalmist says in Psalm 119. And apart from that, you don't have a true compass. And apart from understanding God's standard and then aligning your will to his standard, you're dangerous. You're dangerous for your family. You're dangerous over those that you have influence. And granted, there, man, when... when when people, when I read a church advertisement that says relevant Bible teaching, it's like, are you kidding me? Every Bible teaching, every time you actually teach the Bible, it's relevant. Listen, if you're bored at my teaching, the problem's me. Completely me. Because the Bible's not boring. If I make it boring too, shame on me. Now, if I've taught the Bible and I wasn't boring, but you're bored... Maybe shame on you. I don't mean to shame you. What I'm saying is maybe the problem is that you're not hungry for the things of God. That you've gotten just so callous to the idea of God's revelation, that God's speaking to you, that nothing stirs you. You remember when you first started courting or first started dating? When someone wrote you a card or a note or sent you a message? Oh my gosh. That was like the best thing ever. You hung on every single word. You talked so long on the phone and you didn't care how many minutes there were in your plan because this is love. Now they start to tell you their story about their day. It's like, hey, just tell me you're fine, okay? Let's move on. I don't have time for this, you know? Right? Oh, man, I, I remember the first love note I got. You know, there's this girl that I was crushing on in junior high. And she slipped me a note in the English class. Man, I, I raised my hand, went to the boys' room. You know, I wasn't, wasn't old enough to go to a restroom yet. I'm still in junior high, so it's a boys' room. And there I am in the stall opening this note. And at the end, she said she liked me. <laughs> liked me. And I could feel my face get excited. She liked me. And then the thought went through my mind. What does that mean, like? I like you like a friend, or I like you. All right? So I, I looked up the Greek. What am I, no. <laughs> you see, you know, all of a sudden, there, there was a, a renewed zeal. What does this word mean, like? I want to know. Because it's going to influence my life. Right? I just want to tell you, this girl's name was Mara, and Mara means bitter, and the whole thing didn't work out very well, but, you know, <laughs> it's not the point of my story. I just thought I'd share that with you. Hey, until you take the word of God in, you've got nothing really effectively to give out to those you influence. Be Bible-centered. Not Bible thumping, not, you know, using the scripture to beat people up, but take the word of God in so they have something to give out. My wife and I, we, we, you know, we get Mondays off. Hairdressers, pastors, they get Monday off. And, and so we'll get together at Starbucks, and, and we're trying to read independently and then get together and share with one another the things that we saw. And, and I'll say to Karen, so what did you see in, in you know, your reading this week or today? And, and she'll share with me. My wife's got a great point of view. She'll see things that, wow, I never saw that before. And, and so I'll share with her. But the thing is, she's not looking for me to 
be Pastor Bruce. Well, you know, honey, in the original Hebrew language, what that really means is she's looking for me to be her husband. She's looking for me to be her friend. She's looking for me to share with her what God spoke to my heart, not a Bible study per se. Do you have the experience that you've received something from God? Then give it out. Give it to somebody else. Give it to your kids. Give it to your spouse. Give it to your parents. Give it to your friends. Share it with somebody. Let it out. Be Bible-centered. Okay? Fourth, be shepherds. Take a look with me beginning at verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is verse 28. It says, take heed to yourself. As leaders, and I'm speaking to all of you here. There's nobody who can check out. You're all leaders. As leaders, the first thing you got to do is take heed to yourself. It's a warning. Take care of yourself spiritually. It's just like when you're on the airplane, they tell you, if there's a loss of cabin pressure, not to the mask will drop down. And if you're traveling with people who need assistance, put the mask over your face first. And then help those in need. And if you're not taking in, you can't help others. So, first thing is to be careful of your own spiritual walk, your own spiritual development, to learn to be honest with yourself. Because our, our hearts are deceitful and wicked. And we can look in the mirror and say, oh yeah, everything's good. When you might know that you're not really growing in Christ. So Paul says to them in verse 20, take heed to yourselves and to the flock which is among you to shepherd the flock. The, this flock that Christ purchased with his own blood, you've been entrusted to care for. Do you realize that your children don't belong to you? They belong to God? You're a steward. Um, that your, your work, your job, your possessions, your career, calling, all these things first and foremost belong to God. You're a steward of them. And, and to be a shepherd, what, what's implied there? Well, we know from John 21, as Jesus met Peter and restored him, that part of the duty of a shepherd was to love the sheep, feed the sheep, care for the sheep. To love, nurture, care for, to guide, to protect, to mentor. Peter understood that. When he wrote his first letter to the church in 1 Peter chapter 5, he said of Jesus, he's the chief shepherd. And then he said, look, I'm just trying to follow Jesus. And he said to the other leaders, look, you got to do the same. He's the guy we need to follow. And we need to care for people like Jesus cares for people. He said, look. Savage wolves are going to come into the flock. And even from among yourself, people are going to be raised up. who are going to seek to draw people to themselves. He's warning them of false teachers who aren't concerned about advancing the gospel. Their concern is about building up and drawing people to themselves. And I, I just want to encourage you here. As a church, our, our desire isn't to own you. You're all free in Christ. You have liberty. If this is a place where you grow and where you're, you're fed and nurtured and encouraged and, and you're built up in your faith, fantastic. We, we, we hope that. But you're free. You, you need to find a community, whether it's this one or another one, where, where you can root. And, and then, as, as you do that, you're not, I don't own you. You know, Jesus does. He, he purchased you with his blood. You belong to Jesus. I'm, I'm just trying to care for you as best I understand how with the limited capacity that I have. And the same for the other leaders here. We're all trying to honor Christ in caring and mentoring and, and warning you of the dangers of false teaching, false philosophy. But you're free. And you need to, to pour into your children. You need to pour into your friends. You need to find someone to mentor. Amen. If you want to grow, 
Find somebody to mentor. Find somebody who has traveled less on the journey of faith than you have and show them what's ahead. When you run cross country, you know, there, there's trail marks that are Pike's Peak, but it's called Pukes Peak. And then there's Hernia Hill and, and all of these references to the things that are coming ahead on the course. And the first time that somebody runs on the course, they don't know what's ahead. So you try to warn them and you try to show them and you try to help them so they don't get wiped out and not make it to the finish line. That's what you're trying to do when you mentor people. I thank God for all the young people at this church who are passionately in love with Jesus. Why? Because they are, are stirring others to keep growing. Hey, if you're mentoring somebody and the person you're mentoring is on fire for the Lord, then you've got to be more on fire for the Lord. Amen? So keep going. This is how they keep me on my toes here. That and putting things on the shelf where I can't reach. Those are the two ways they keep me on my toes here. And if you want to, to grow, shepherd. Shepherd your family. Love them, feed them, warn them, care for them as Christ does. Shepherd friends. Shepherd those in your church community. Shepherd those in a community group. Fifth, be generous, giving. Verse 33, I've coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those with me. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul, Paul starts off, he said, look, I didn't co covet anyone's silver or gold or apparel. I wasn't doing this gig because I wanted the paycheck. He didn't do it for financial gain. He, he did it because he knew that God had called him to this. And then he said, look, I've discovered, and you need to remember what Jesus said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And one of the characteristics of watching you, as your children grow and gain maturity is that at birthdays and holidays, they become more selfless. They become more giving. It's no longer a concern of what do I get? It's what can I give? It's a, a great experience for a parent because you know that your children are maturing and growing in a way that is demonstrating love. How do you plan to sacrifice this year? How do you plan to give? Your time, your talent, your treasure, to your family, to your church community, to your community, however you, you might look at that at large? Are you a generous person, a giving person? If you want to leave with passion, be a generous person, a giving person. It's a great gift. And sixth, to be prayerful. Look with me beginning at verse 36. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And they all wept freely. And they fell on Paul's neck and they kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that he would, they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. As, as Paul concluded this exhortation, this, this gathering of, of leaders, they knew that they weren't going to see him again. And man, it was heartfelt. There were tears that flowed. Why? Because they knew that Paul loved them. And they loved Paul. And whoever you exercise influence in their life should know that you love them. And Lord willing, you're blessed to know that they love you in return. But then he, he, he poured into them his heart. He poured into them his exhortation, his encouraging words. And he understood fundamentally that none of it meant a difference apart from the working of God's Spirit. And so he realized the most important thing that he could do was to pray for them. He prayed for them. He prayed with them. They prayed for him. It's a beautiful thing. You know, Jesus said that his house is to be, what, a house of? Prayer. Right answer. Are we people of prayer? You know? 
And then you're encouraged during the program time to fill out a prayer request. Do you believe that prayer matters? Do you find yourself filling out prayer requests? Are you moved enough that you'd receive those lists of prayer requests and pray over some or all of them, however God moved you, every week or whenever God would move you? Are you a person of prayer? When there's an opportunity to pray at the end of the service and, and people are up here to pray with us, are you more concerned about what somebody thinks about you? Or are you more concerned about God moving through prayer in ways that he wouldn't otherwise move, that you humble yourself and you come up and pray? As there are gatherings of people praying before services Sunday, other occasions, have you ever found yourself compelled to attend a prayer gathering? And I understand it's a stretch. You know, the, the first time when you pray in public with other people, and you know how awkward that is, right? Because we're all comparing ourselves. And, and somebody in the group starts to pray, and they're like golden tongue. It's like, well, forget it, you know. My stuff don't count now, yeah. You know? I remember the first time, man, when I was ministering at the senior center, there was a guy who was coming from the church to minister. And this guy was huge, like the size of an eclipse. He was in a, a motorcycle gang, wore a leather vest, and, and you know his arms were, were all tatted, and, and so he was inked up everywhere. And, and this guy was enormous. And uh, his name was Booger. I didn't, I didn't question him, you know. I was like, you know, I didn't want to upset the guy. He could pull my arms off and beat me to death with my own arms. And so I said, hey, uh, Booger, how about you open in prayer? <laughs> hey, man, don't stumble. I'll, I'll change the guy's name if I have to, you know? The guy's name was Frederick. And so I said, Frederick, no. And he looked at me and he said, I, I've never prayed out loud before. I'm afraid. Wow. There's, there's this guy, you know, just people saw this guy and they, they cleared way. He was afraid. And I, I said, look, man, it's just like talking to your friend. It, it doesn't matter if you use big words or fancy terms. Just, just talk to God like your friend. And he started to pray and he said, Jesus, big bro. And I looked up and everybody in the room started to cry. It was just so genuine, so real, so beautiful. We, we've got to learn, people, to be people of prayer. We've got to learn to pray with our kids whether they're little or big. Got to learn to, to pray with those we serve with in the church community. We've got to learn to pray in our community. You know, at your workplace, you can say when somebody says, hey, can I pray for you? You can even say, can I pray for you right now? Your neighborhood. This would be a good thing if we're going to be zealous, passionate leaders. We've got to be available. Christ focus, Bible-centered, shepherds, generous, giving people of prayer. And so I am hopeful that God is speaking to our hearts by his spirit about that. And so if I can, let me pray for you. <laughs> oh, Lord, you're good. You're always good. Lord, you you, you've assembled an amazing group of people in this church community, this body, Lord. And Lord, I, I come and I, I've been blessed to serve you here 18 years and I know that it's not the end, that the best years of Calvary Nexus lie ahead. And Father, I'm excited that what you've done here is, is for your glory and you've proved yourself faithful, but I'm excited, Lord, what you're doing and what you're going to do. And Lord, there, there isn't a single person here that isn't necessary for that work. And I pray that you'd open our eyes to see that we are leaders, all of us, and to make us passionate leaders by your Spirit. If there's anybody here who's not yet received Christ as Lord and Savior, before you get a chance to leave today, I want to encourage you. Today's the day of your salvation. That if, if you just right now in your heart let God know that you're ready to submit and follow him and, and receive Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, God has promised to come into your life that you'll be born of the Spirit 
that you'll be forgiven of all your sin, past, present, and future, that you'll have a new spiritual life, that you can begin to understand God and, and begin to walk in His power to live a life that's pleasing to Him. And if that's you today, if you're just sensing God drawing you to Himself, let Him know. And so, Father, you're the only one who really knows our hearts. I pray that you would be honored in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 